Welcome to the Fall 2019 Special Collections Exhibit and Lecture, Archaeology from Adam to Jesus. On exhibit here in the rotunda are antiquities from APU's Bible Lands Collection. The collection was donated to Azusa Pacific in April 2018. It is comprised of about 80 items, including pottery, metal, glass, covers many of the archaeological periods. It is developed with the express purpose to preserve artifacts in a teaching collection to demonstrate the cultural setting in which biblical events took place. We are pleased to exhibit 28 selected items from the collection today. Our speaker for the day is Dr. Robert Mullins. Bob Mullins is professor and chair of the uh, Department of Biblical and Religious Studies at Azusa Pacific University, where he has taught for the past 13 years. He earned his PhD in archaeology from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he also served as a research assistant to Professor Ami Matsar and the Beth Sheehan Valley Archaeological Project. In addition to archaeological works in Jerusalem, Beth Sheehan, Tel Rehob, and Gisar, Bob has also excavated at Tel Atkana and Tel Jaziri in southeastern Turkey. Bob currently co-directs the archaeological excavations at Tel Abel Bet Makkah on behalf of Azusa Pacific University with two longtime friends and colleagues. Dr. Nama Yahalam Mack and Dr. Nava Panitz Cohen of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Two of Bob's most recent publications are The Late Bronze Age with Eli Yanai in Volume 3 of The Pottery of Ancient Israel and Its Neighbors, and the Old Testament portion of The Atlas of the Biblical World with Mark Vitalis Hoffman, recently published by Fortress Press. Please join me in welcoming to the platform Dr. Bob Mullins. Okay, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks for coming. And I just hope that I don't put you to sleep during this presentation. <laughs> but uh, Ken did mention the Atlas of the Biblical World and I just want to hold up a copy. This was just published. It came out about a month and a half or so ago. So this is very recent. If you're interested in gaining a kind of broader perspective on the biblical world, um, archeology span and text and, and getting that kind of backstory to the Bible, um, I highly recommend this. And you can find it easily, just go to Amazon, type in Mullins Atlas and it'll pop right up, all right? Okay, so let's get started. The whole idea of this uh, talk is to provide some context for these artifacts that you see around you. Because when you walk along and you just look at the displays, you don't have any really clear understanding of how this fits into the world at the time. And so this is part of what I hope to do today. And I thought I'd start off by just mentioning the fact that when it comes to the Old Testament, all the different archaeological and historical periods are based on materials that artifacts were made from. So we have, for example, early on, humans are making artifacts of stone. So we speak of the Stone Age. And then they came across um, the idea of using copper and making implements from copper. And so we have something called the Calcolithic period, the Copper Stone Age. Then they figured out that you could add tin to copper and harden it to where it became a more durable metal. And so we have the Bronze Age, and then finally we get the invention of iron and uh, carburized iron, and so we have the um, Iron Age. Now, you'll see later on that when you get to the New Testament period, we no longer talk about materials that artifacts are made from, but uh, we think more in terms of um, nation states that are controlling regions. So we have the Roman period and the Byzantine period and, and so forth. Um, so um, what you see here on this slide just gives you a rough idea of the spans of time that these different periods are attributed to. Um, for my talk today, we're gonna be focusing mainly on the end of the Stone Age, called the Neolithic period. We're gonna skip to the Bronze Age and then we'll get into the Iron Age because these are the artifacts that we have on display. 
Now, um, that tail end of the Stone Age is today called the Neolithic period, New Stone Age. And this is a time when people have transitioned from hunter-gathering economy to a predominantly agricultural economy, growing their own food rather than going out and finding it and, and bringing it home. And so we get the establishment of farming villages. When you move to the Chalcolithic period, um, we start seeing, especially in Egypt and Mesopotamia, the first cities and the beginning of writing in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Um, when we get to the Bronze Age, we will see the beginning of city-states. This is already even a thousand years before Abraham. You get the beginning of walled cities in the Holy Land, and then we're gonna move on to the Iron Age where we speak about more developed cities and actual nation states, like Israel, Aram, Damascus, Ammon, Moab, Edom, these are all nation states. Now, why do we call this from Adam to Abraham? Well, Adam is convenient because in the Bible, Adam is portrayed as a farmer. He is living what we would call a Neolithic lifestyle. He's farming. And um, remember that, um, as a punishment for his disobedience, Adam was um, to till the soil. And then um, we also read about Abel and uh, Cain, um, who um, are sheep herders and um, farmers. So again, we're getting this kind of Neolithic lifestyle. So what can we say about uh, the culture itself? Just a few items just to highlight. Um, even though the Neolithic period begins around 9000 BC, Pottery doesn't show up until about 6,000 BC. And here you see an example of a, a jar. Um, uh, it's made by hand, as you would expect for the beginning of pottery. Um, it, it's, the clay is very coarse. It's not very well fired, probably just fired in open pits. And some pieces are decorated like you see here uh, with these incised lines. Now on display, we have uh, a, a, a one of the bowls that it's somewhat similar to what you see the arrow pointing to, um, which is our example of the Neolithic period. And uh, so what you're seeing here doesn't start until about 6,000 BC. Now, of course, you ask the question, so what did people do before 6,000? What did they do before there was pottery? Well, we know that they had they used skins, they had implements made of wood, and we also know that they had basketry. And we know this because there is a cave nearby the Dead Sea called Nahal Hamar, where inside the cave, they found still preserved basketry from the Neolithic period, from about 5000 BC. And uh, because of the dry climate, it's been preserved. And uh, one of the things that uh, experts have noticed is that the basketry is very intricately woven. In other words, there's already been a long history of making items from, uh, from basketry. Now, probably the most famous Neolithic site is Jericho. Now, there are dozens, hundreds of Neolithic sites all around the Middle East, this map that you're looking at here. But I just want to highlight Jericho as the most famous example. And of course, everyone knows the story of Joshua and Jericho. So I thought this would be a good choice. Here is the tell of Jericho that you see here. And here's what Jericho looked like uh, in the Neolithic period. It is a walled city. It is the earliest walled city that we know of. And so for this reason, um, archeologists, and even if you ever visit Jericho, you'll see signs saying the world, world's oldest city. And, um, and this is partly why. You have a city wall that protects it, and inside you see these round houses where uh, people live their lives. And they even have a watchtower on the wall there to kind of view the surroundings. Now, moving on from the Neolithic period, let's go to the Bronze Age. As I say, we don't have any artifacts here specifically from the Chalcolithic period, so I'm just gonna skip that and move on to the Bronze Age, which as you see here is from 3500 to 1200 BC. So that's a big span of time. And of course, a lot of changes take place over a couple thousand years. And so what archeologists and historians have done is to divide the Bronze Age into three major phases, early, middle, and late. And as you see here, the early begins around 3500. This is well before Abraham. 
okay? Because Abraham shows up on the scene during the Middle Bronze Age around 2000. So some of what we're going to be looking at is 1,000 years before Abraham. Um, again, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob um, belong to what we call the Middle Bronze Age. And then the Late Bronze Age would be the time of Moses, the Hebrews in Egypt, the Exodus, and really ending with the conquest of um, Canaan uh, by Joshua. So let's look at each one of these three phases. Um, we have here the Early Bronze Age. Um, and um, the vessels at this time are still handmade. We have no wheel-made items at all yet. They're still handmade. The clays are still very coarse, a little bit better fired than they were earlier in the Neolithic period. Um, but we start to see a use of painted decoration quite a bit. It's quite popular, especially, as I say here, between 3500 and 2700 BC. Now, the other popular um, painted style during the time are these vessels here covered by a red coating, what we call red slip and burnish. In other words, they take a stone or piece of wood and they polish it to give it a nice polished sheen. So these vessels would be quite typical of this period. Now, what's happening in the country? Well, we have the beginning of city-states. Now, already in Egypt and Mesopotamia from before this, a thousand years before this, you're having the beginnings of cities. But within the land of Canaan, we don't have cities coming on the scene until the early Bronze Age, some around 31, 3200 uh, BC. And basically, as you see by this map, all the black dots are indicating major cities that were walled cities, and they're called city-states because each city-state surrounded by a wall had its own king, and they controlled territory around it of smaller towns and villages that would be more or less equivalent to our counties, all right? And so it's somewhat like, you know, the feudal system, you might say, to, uh, to some degree. Um, here's just one example of one of these early Bronze Age cities. This one, again, is about from about 3000 BC. You can see an example of the city wall that surrounds it with these semicircular towers protecting it. Um, notice at the top there you've got um, houses, because of course this is a city with um, um, houses, people living in it. You can see off to the right that there is a temple complex here, because they had their gods that they worshipped. And the other um, item I want to point out is there's a reservoir, because a rod is located in the desert. And water is very scarce. And yet you've got a city of several thousand people living in it. So how are they going to get their water? So one of the ways they collected water is that they built a system whereby when it rained, all the water would drain towards this reservoir. And then the sediment would sit towards the bottom. And they had what would in fact be a, a big cistern. Here's an artist a depiction of what a typical family compound would look like. Remember, this is Old Testament time, so people are living as extended families, um, several houses belonging to children and grandchildren, all in the same uh, compound. And this is an actual house from a rod of this period of time. Uh, notice that you've got this doorway on the east. It's a rectangular shape. And notice on the inside, you can see benches. Um, and this is an example of a group sitting in one of these houses that's been partially restored to give you an idea of how, you know, people would go to the family home and they would sit around on these benches and talk and, and, um, and eat and so forth, and they can even use them for sleeping. All right, let's move on to from Abraham to Moses. This um, depiction you see here comes from a tomb in Middle Egypt um, called Beni Hassan. And it depicts uh, Canaanite traders. And so if you want to know what did Abraham look like in Isaac and Jacob, here you've got a beautiful example. If you look to the left side, you see the two men. One is holding a composite bow, which is becoming very popular precisely in this period of time. He also is holding a battle ax in his right hand, which they would use in warfare, a sharp blade that they basically would crack the skull of uh, their opponent. Um, you can see how the women are dressed. By the way, looking at their colorful clothing, who does this remind you of? If we think about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who does it remind you of? 
Joseph and the coat of many colors, okay? This is the kind of thing that is in the mind of the biblical readers, all right? Um, and you'll see that they have donkeys as um, animals for um, uh, bear, uh, beasts of burden. I might also point out the second man from the left, uh, to the right of the man on the left there, is holding a lyre. This is just like the lyre that David would have played. Same style. Didn't change over thousands of years. And here's a typical ves vessel of the Middle Broth age. Um, this one is thrown on the fast wheel. This is the period, Abraham, when we begin to see potters sitting down and using a kick wheel to spin very, very quickly to um, um, make um, beautifully shaped uh, forms. The clays are very fine. The firing is first rate. And when decorated, this red polish slip is um, what's very, very popular. Now, based on um, archaeological finds, as well as Egyptian depictions, uh, we have this artistic recreation of a typical Canaanite family in the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So again, Abraham himself would have looked something similar to this. Uh, notice the beards. Um, notice um, the, um, the furniture that they're sitting on. How do they know what this furniture looked like? We do have some depictions on Egyptian uh, tombs of furniture, but actually the furniture that you see here was found in a tomb in Jericho. Again, because of the dry climate, it's nearby the Dead Sea, wood survived 4,000 years. And so um, the artist then is using actual furniture um, as examples of, uh, for his uh, depiction here. You also see on the table there, the arrow is pointing at a vessel, typical again of the time of Abraham and the ancestors. Uh, notice the woman reaching into a storage jar where they can keep grain, they can keep wine, they can keep oil. And um, notice that you have the different uh, fruits of the land. You have pomegranates, you have wheat, barley, you have dates, all kinds of goodies. And seeds of these have been preserved in tombs. So we know a lot about their diet. Now to help illustrate uh, the patriarchal period, I want to use um, our site, APU site of Avel Beit Maha as an example of some finds and what a typical city would have looked like in the time of Abraham. Now, as uh, Ken mentioned, um, I direct this, uh, co-direct this project uh, on behalf of APU with my two colleagues from the Hebrew University, Naama and, and Nava Panitz Cohen, who I've known for many, many years. And um, all three of us were students of this fellow that you see standing in the middle, probably one of the most well-respected archaeologists in Israel today, Amichai Mazar, flanked by two APU students that dug with us on the dig. So let me make a little plug. If you would be interested in coming digging with us, in 2021, there will be an APU study tour to Israel, where there will be a two-week um, study tour of Israel, followed by uh, two weeks on the dig for those that would be interested in extending their stay and digging with us. If that doesn't work for you, um, you can still join us. We're digging every summer and we can do an independent study if you want to get uh, credit uh, for it. So all you need to do is if you're interested, just drop me an email, just type in Robert Mullins, it'll pop up on your a APU email and then we can uh, work something out. Now the site of Avel Beit Maha is located right smack on the border of of Lebanon and Syria today. And this was not only the case today, but even in antiquity, it was also in a borderlands region. It's just that then Lebanon was known as Phoenicia, Syria was known as Aram, and Israel, of course, was Israel. And here this photo shows you how close we are to uh, the Lebanese border. But quiet, secure, beautiful place to be. And to give you a little bit of an impression of the tell, I want to show you this video we took last summer using our drone. And here we're approaching the tell from the south. Uh, area F there at the uh, bottom is the southern tip of the city uh, where we found fortification walls from the time of Abraham. And the drone is now turning north. 
And as it goes up the lower city, this very elongated tell, look to the right, that little square area we just opened up this summer where we found an inscription that I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, that big tree is where we have our breakfast every morning out in the field. And then we're coming up on area A. This is our largest and most important area. This basically um, uh, documents uh, the period of the judges through the time of King David. So um, stories in the Bible, like the wise woman of Avel Beit Maha, are um, belonging to this phase that you just saw there. Now the drone is flying to the upper city, on the higher part of the tell, and you can see area B, where we have a large um, Israelite period uh, building, um, some sort of administrative building. Some of you that may have heard of the little faience head that I'll show you a little bit later that may depict a biblical king was found inside that building. Uh, the drone is now flying along the northern edge of the site, so you can, by looking down, you can see how elongated this tell is. It's about 25 acres in size. Uh, those little bumps that you see at the very northern end are Israeli army bunkers, all right? And as the drone flies now along the western side, you get another glance of area B in the upper city. Um, all this area would have been inhabited in the time of David and also during the divided monarchy. There you can see, again, area A at the very top end of the lower city. And the drone's going to kind of circle in on that. Again, all of these remains you see here from the time of David. And look at all the area that we have to excavate. We can dig here for a decade and find a lot of cool stuff. This is one of the most important sites for the time of David, even the period of the judges in all of Israel. And here you get a glance looking down the Hula Valley, the upper Jordan Valley towards the Sea of Galilee, which is about a 45 minute drive uh, to the south. Well, here's how um, we think the city would have looked like in the time of Abraham. Remember we talked about city-states in the early Bronze Age? We had city-states also in the middle Bronze Age. And again, you would have a walled city with a king controlling territory of smaller towns and, and hamlets and stuff surrounding it. Um, most of these cities, including our site, has the lower city, and then the upper city is where you have this acropolis, where you'd have your temple, you'd have your palace that the king lived in, and so forth. Uh, just to kind of feature one of the nice pieces we found at, at our site from the time of Abraham is this nice uh, juglet here that you can see, again, beautifully decorated, wheel made, very um, well done, all right? Now, the period that follows the time of the ancestors would be the late Bronze Age, which is the time of Hebrew bondage in Egypt, Moses, and the Exodus. Now, the pottery is pretty much continuing the same tradition of the Middle Bronze Age, but there is some deterioration. They're not using the fast wheel anymore. They're using a slower wheel. And um, the firing and decoration isn't as well done as it used to be. And some of this reason may be for what I'm going to talk about in just a moment. But I wanted to just point out that you can see the decorative motifs that they have here, and especially on the left side. This motif of the date palm tree, which represents the tree of life in the ancient Near East, including ancient Israel, flanked by two ibex. This is a persistent theme in, in Canaanite uh, um, decoration and even in Israelite as well, as we'll be seeing uh, a little bit uh, later. So what were the political situations at the time? Well, throughout the late Bronze Age, after the time of Abraham, um, up to Joshua, Egypt is controlling the land of Canaan. And you see how um, the gray swath goes up uh, where Israel is today. This was all under Egyptian control, Egyptian administration. Now, why did the Egyptians want to control Canaan? Well, a couple of reasons. One is, is to milk the country for a lot of its agriculture, that uh, items that cannot be grown in Egypt were in abundance in Canaan. And so they could bring these goods uh, to Egypt. The other is, is that you had a couple of big empires at the time that were wanting to push their way southwards, the Hittites and the Hurrians of the kingdom of Mitanni. And so Egypt wanted to be in Canaan in order to hold them back so they don't invade Egypt. The other thing that interested uh, the Egyptians and everyone living at the time is trade, Mediterranean trade. 
particularly coming from the Aegean world and from the island of Cyprus, which was then called Alashia. Uh, we don't have any of the Aegean or Cypriot um, pottery um, available to us here, but this just gives you a kind of a visual idea. So the late Bronze Age is a time of internationalization, um, trade and, and exchange going on throughout the ancient world at the time. Now, um, at the very southern tip of the uh, city of the Middle and Late Bronze Age, uh, we have this tower that the circle is surrounding. And I'm highlighting this because we had a very, very nice find on the floor of a room abutting this tower, um, dating to the time of Moses. And this woman, Diane, is holding a small jug. And what was amazing is that inside this jug was found this hoard of silver. You see all these small broken pieces of silver, you know, um, earrings and so forth. These were used in monetary exchange because coins are not around yet. And so the way that people did monetary exchange was to take a valuable metal like silver or gold and weigh it. So the shekel that's so well known from the Bible is not a coin, but a unit of weight. And so you'd put um, the, let's say, a one shekel weight on one pan of a pan scale, and you put on the silver on the other until it balances out, and that's your one shekel of, um, of silver. So um, I do have some examples of such weights. Uh, the one in the lower right is actually a two shekel weight. Um, above it, we have a weight called the peam. Now, until the discovery of this particular weight, no one knew what a peem was. If you go to 1 Samuel 13, 21, it says that the Israelites would go to the Philistines to sharpen their tools, and it cost them one peem. But we don't know how much a peem is. Well, now that we have the weight, we know that it's two-thirds of a shekel. And you'll read that, actually, if you have, let's say, an NIV Bible, it will actually tell you two-thirds of a shekel. They just give you the um, translated uh, unit of weight. And the one to the left of that in the upper left-hand corner is a becca. It's a half shekel weight, all right? And I might point out with the silver earrings in particular, of course, we always are thinking in terms of our culture that only women wear earrings, or for the most part. Okay, but in antiquity, we have examples like the two Assyrian men you see in the upper right wearing earrings as well. So men and women wore earrings in antiquity. And we even, because of our discovery, were featured by um, La Cucaracha, those of you that are familiar with that cartoon uh, strip um, dealing with um, our discovery. Now we find a lot of other cool things in the late Bronze Age that just open the Bible to us. For example, everyone has heard of Baal. Baal and Asherah. Okay, so who, who is Baal? Well, his full name is actually Baal Hadad. Baal means Lord or Prince or Master. Hadad is his personal name. So Baal is really a title. And Hadad is his personal name. Hadad means Thunderer. So Lord Thunderer or Prince Thunderer would be um, his uh, full name. He's symbolized by the young bull and is often depicted as standing on the back of the bull. We have a lot of depictions of Baal on the back of a bull. He had three wives. The two most, I would say, well-known that are known from the Bible are Baal and Astarte, who is called actually in the Bible Ashtoreth, and also, and probably even more fam famous than Baal and Ashtoreth, is Baal and Asherah, who was actually originally his, his father El's wife. But Baal stole away his father's wife and took her to himself. And so it's Baal and Asherah that are mentioned most commonly in the Old Testament. But again, if you're just reading the Bible without this kind of background, it's hard to appreciate this kind of larger religious culture of which Israel was a participant in, in, in some regards. Okay, let's move on to what we call the united monarchy, um, is um, uh, from the time of Samuel, Saul, David, and even Solomon. Uh, this depiction you see here is of a griffin. This is what the Bible calls a seraph, you know, cherubim and seraphim, okay? This is a seraph, and this is an Israelite depiction. This was found at Megiddo from the time of the United Monarchy. Um, and so this is a time when we have developed cities and we start developing nation states, like David. 
the king of a nation, Israel, all right? But it took about Israel about 200 years to get to that place of being a nation state. For the first 200 years, from the time of Joshua up until around King Saul, we're dealing with the period of the judges, where people are basically farmers living in the hill country. And so all the dots that you see here are the various Israelite uh, villages that were in the hills. Um, and um, you have one example, of Beersheba uh, here, that would be typical of these highland uh, villages from the time of Gideon and other people that you read about uh, from this time. It's also worth pointing out that this is when we first start seeing Israelite writing. And this particular one is interesting. It says, Ishbal ben Beda. Um, Ishbal is a name known from the Bible. He was one of Saul's son. Now, this particular Ishbal is not related to Saul. He's the son of Beda, not Shaul. But it's the same name, okay? Man of Baal literally is uh, what the name means. And so this name does appear on an inscription uh, at a site called Kirbet uh, Kayafa. Uh, but I would say that, you know, if we th think about the United Monarchy, and particularly, da particularly David, um, Jerusalem, of course, is the city that captures most of our imagination. And um, Jerusalem of David's time was basically a city of about 10 to 15 acres sitting on a kind of elongated hill that's encircled by the yellow here. And notice how the mountains surrounding that are higher than the hill on which Jerusalem itself is set. And you get that impression when you're in the city of David, you look around and all the hills are surrounding you. So if you go to Jerusalem, read Psalm 125 too and see if the Bible doesn't come alive for you. That's a little plug to go on a trip to Israel. It is very well worth it. You will be amazed at how it opens the Bible to you. Here's an artist's depiction of what the city would have looked like in David's time. Notice how his palace is at the highest point of the hill. So when we read the story of David and Bathsheba and how David is spying on Bathsheba, who is on her rooftop, you understand why. Because he is commanding the highest point of the city. Now, David is a known historical figure. We do have an inscription from Tel Dan, a site about four and a half miles east of Avel Beit Maha, that mentions the um, uh, Hazael, king of Aram Damascus, killing both the king of Israel and the king of the house of David, which is another way of saying the southern kingdom of Judah, because we're dealing with the lineage of David. This is the only mention that we have to date of David outside the pages of the Bible. So this is external um, evidence for the historical existence of King David. Even though the inscription itself is about 150 years later than David, it's alluding to the founder of the Davidic dynasty. Now, from the same period of David, our site of Avel Beit Macha comes back into focus because we have a very famous story, somewhat infamous, you might say, because it involves a guy getting his head chopped off, um, but it involves our site. A rebel by the name of Sheva has insulted David, called for revolt against him, and he hightails it to our city from Jerusalem. And so David sends Joab, his military commander, to capture him. And indeed, he is ready. He has surrounded the city. He is ready to conquer it in order to take this rebel into custody. And who negotiates with him but a woman who's only described as a wise woman? There are several things about her that intrigue us. One is the fact that she has authority. She negotiates with Joab. She doesn't say, let me go get permission from the elders to turn them over to you. She makes a decision. The other thing is interesting is that when she's speaking with Joab, she's describing the city as a place of inquiry. The Hebrew word suggests some sort of divination going on, and a place of peacemaking, settling disputes between people. And it's interesting in this regard, archaeologists are always looking for parallels from other countries in the surrounding Near East for, like, what is this wise woman? Do we have parallels to this? Well, we find a parallel from 300 years before David in Anatolia, which we know today as Turkey, where there are wise women, several of them, many of them even mentioned by name. 
And these women are ritual experts. They're involved in divination, giving oracles, purification rites. Um, they are involved in advice giving. Um, and they're regarded as repositories of folk knowledge for the culture. Um, many aspects of this seem to kind of echo this wise woman of, of our site. And so, um, and we may actually have um, some indication of whatever ritual activity that she was involved in in the Davidic area of our city. You're looking now at a, a picture of a small temple or shrine um, where you see where it says main hall and notice that we have this very unique installation, offering table, cult stones, and also we have this jug filled with, can anyone figure out what those are inside that jug? They are animal knuckle bones. More than 400 knuckle bones of sheep, goat, gazelle, deer, most of them belonging to females. But such hordes are in virtually every case related to um, divination. And so, um, so this is, I think to us is quite interesting because it may to some degree reflect this culture of the city that the wise woman uh, was attached to. Just this past summer, we found this very nice um, find here. It's a seal showing the face of a person on one side and on the belly side, we have the tree of life flanked not by ibex on both sides, but an ibex on the right and an ostrich on the left. Okay, this is an Israelite seal. So it shows the continuation of these traditions even from the earlier periods into the Israelite period. All right, let's move to the period of the divided monarchy. Um, and here too, we have a seal. This is also from Megiddo. It says in Hebrew, Lishma Eved Yerovoam, belonging to Shema, servant of Jeroboam, probably Jeroboam II, a king of the Northern Kingdom. Let me just point out, there are a couple of capitals uh, during the divided monarchy. You have Samaria, the capital of the Northern Kingdom of Israel in the North, uh, Jerusalem, of course, in the South. And I just want to show you one picture from Samaria where the royal Acropolis was excavated at, at the very early in the 20th century. Uh, the drawing on the right kind of shows you the surviving outlines of this palace. And amongst the items that were found were several of these ivory depictions of cherubim. Now, again, when you read about cherubim in the Bible, cherubim guarding access to the Garden of Eden, we're not talking about babies with arrows and, you know, little Cupid kinds of things, nor are we talking about angels. These are the creatures that are being spoken of here. And these are Israelite depictions. So these are the creatures that the Israelites had in mind. Uh, these were used actually as inlays to wooden furniture, to walls and so forth. And so when you read in the book of Amos, where he's castigating the wealthy of Samaria, the capital city of the north, and saying, you live in your ivory palaces. We're not talking about palaces made of ivory. We're talking about palaces that were adorned in ivory with such ivory uh, inlays. The other capital city, uh, Jerusalem, um, a smaller city in the time of David, um, a little bit larger in Solomon's time. In Solomon's time, it becomes about 30 acres in size. But after the fall of the northern kingdom and many exiles of the north fleeing to, to the south uh, and living in Jerusalem, we get Hezekiah encircling Jerusalem and all those refugees with a city wall that you see highlighted here in orange bringing Jerusalem to 150 acres, a population of about 20,000. And this was the size of Jerusalem up until the Babylonians destroyed the city in 586. Now, many, many finds, important finds come from this city, but let me just highlight a few here because I think they will be of interest. We have a seal. This is the actual seal with the name of Jezebel on one example. The other example is a fellow by the name of Abdi. Um, these are usually made of stone, precious stone, and they are carved by special carvers. And what they do is like they would wear them as signet rings on their finger or wear them around their neck. They are officials. And um, if they send off a letter, that letter is going to be written on a papyrus document, rolled up. And as you see in the example above, uh, clay lumps are going to be put on the strings that tie the um, document 
closed, and then they take that signet ring and they impress their stamp on there. So it's somewhat like, you know, the letters that you would write to your boyfriend or girlfriend, and you'd put the sealing wax on there and then you know, put in that monogram. It's the same concept. But I would say probably the most interesting one that's come out of Jerusalem is one belonging to King Hezekiah himself, found just two years ago. Uh, you know, belonging to Hezekiah, Melech Yehuda, belonging to Hezekiah, king of Judah. We also have a seal of Baruch, Jeremiah's scribe, Baruch ben Neriah. And um, here you can see the, um, his name written in uh, the Hebrew, and we have a fingerprint also on here. When the impression was made, uh, the finger slipped off and hit the wet clay, so who knows, this could be the fingerprint of Baruch, for all we know. So very, very cool stuff. Well, let me show you the latest cool thing. Uh, our Area K, um, we just opened this this past summer. Uh, we found um, part of a room filled with jars. This particular jar, when we restored it, we found that there is on there, and I don't know how well you can see it, there is an inscription written on there in ink on the jar, uh, this is a bit of a close-up of it. Again, I'm not sure how clear it is. It's very, very faint. But we've just had two epigraphers, two specialists in ancient Hebrew writing, confirm that what it says, and you're the first ones to see this, okay? No one else has seen this uh, translation yet. And it's belonging to Benayo. Now, Benayo is not attested anywhere in... Um, yet in inscriptions, but it is the northern Israelite form of Benaiah. Now, Benaiah, um, which is the Judean form, the Yah ending rather than the Yo ending of northern Israelites, Benaiah was one of David's merry men, and later he becomes um, uh, Solomon's military commander. And actually, in the transition of power from David to Solomon, Benaiah is one of Solomon's supporters. So this is the same name, but this individual, rather than Benaiah, the Judean ending, he's a northern Israelite, so he has Benayo. We have, for example, Zechariah. Everyone knows the prophet Zechariah. In the north, it's the Hario. It's that Yo ending, all right? So a northern Israelite name showing up on this jar. And we think that this room could be a storeroom. And so next summer, one of the things we're going to be looking for are more jars, perhaps other inscriptions with other personal names on them. One more thing that I just want to show you. Remember in the video that you saw, Area B in the upper city, part of a building, a big administrative building, but we, as you see here, what I've highlighted in blue are just a few of the walls of this much larger building, but already cool stuff has come out of it. For example, um, from a pit outside this building, we have this figurine head of a woman, probably the goddess Astarte, done in um, Phoenician style. We have this beautiful decorated jar, a Phoenician bichrome jar, indicating trade relations going on with Phoenicia, today known as Lebanon. And we have this very famous head now, um, uh, depicting some sort of an elite. We don't know if he was a general, governor of the city, um, or maybe even a king. Uh, if it is a king, it could be someone like Hazael of Damascus, it could be someone like Ahab, um, or Jehoram of Israel. It could also be a Phoenician because they all look the same. They all dress the same. But obviously the quality tells us that it's a very important uh, figure. And then just this past summer, uh, we found this figurine of a woman holding a tambourine. Uh, these are quite common in Northern Israel. Israel. And to give you a little bit better look, a, a look at this uh, building, um, we did this past summer 3D modeling um, of all of our areas. I'm just selecting this one little bit here and just rotating it to show what can be done now with technology, where we can actually measure accurately lengths and widths of walls. Um, we can even descend down inside individual rooms and study the relationships. Uh, between different walls and floors without ever going back in the field. We have everything digitized and available to us. Okay, let's move on to the New Testament, and this is where I'm going to uh, wrap things up. Again, the shift is from, um, uh, 
using materials as um, period identifiers to the cultures that actually controlled these various um, places. And so uh, Roman Byzantine period, which would include the time of Jesus, um, here you see some of the um, uh, maps showing some of the primary cities, including Capernaum, where Jesus ministered, Jerusalem, where he was crucified, uh, oil lamp of the period. And I put this um, passage out of Matthew 25 uh, because um, it illustrates, the, it's the parable of the 10 virgins. This is the type of oil lamp that's being referred to. And also Matthew 5, putting a lamp on a lampstand, not putting it underneath a bowl. Um, and so here you have these examples here. Um, when it comes to uh, Jesus, um, this is what Jerusalem would have looked like in Jesus's time, beginning with the upper room, okay, where Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples, going over to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's betrayed by Judas, taken before Caiaphas. Uh, we know approximately the location of the house of Caiaphas. He then is uh, uh, placed in front of Herod Antipas and Pilate, Pontius Pilate, where Pilate condemns him to death by crucifixion. And then you see here the site of the crucifixion. Now what I want to do to kind of wrap things up is to focus on the crucifixion. Um, but on the way, I just might mention that we do have historical evidence for Pontius Pilate. Um, we know that he actually lived in Caesarea, a big city on the coast, and was in Jerusalem because it was Passover time. Um, but we have coins, we have depictions, we have inscriptions, all related to this um, prefect um, of uh, Judah um, in the time of Jesus. Now, when it comes to the place of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, all of these are in, housed today inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, or as the original builders called it, the Church of the Resurrection. We know quite a bit about um, methods of crucifixion, in part because we have found in, in a tomb in Jerusalem an ankle bone of a crucified man with a nail driven in. Now, according to the nail in the ankle, the man that you see, it would be on your, on the, on the left side, um, the, it appears that the nails were driven in from the side. Now, we typically think that only Jesus was nailed to the cross. This is not true. People, generally, everyone was nailed because remember, this is capital punishment. And so they want to make it as cruel and painful as possible. And so uh, these individuals, as well as Jesus, were all nailed to the cross. Now, um, this just briefly shows um, how what was originally a tomb that Jesus was buried in and nearby place of Calvary later was cut away from the hillside and enclosed within the church. We don't have the time to go through that, but I thought it would be helpful to, um, when we're talking about how Jesus was buried, especially, to compare it with Old Testament practices. In the Old Testament times, people were buried in burial caves, of which you see these small openings below the houses. These are all burials from the time of Hezekiah, the prophet Isaiah, and so forth. Now, each of these burials usually would lead to a hall where you have several rooms stemming off that central hall with burial benches on them where the bodies would be laid on the bench. Here we have a kind of an example here showing a small entrance, um, a burial bench with a kind of um, holding, uh, you know, some sort of a holder for the head. Uh, where the uh, body would be laid for about a year to allow the flesh to decay. Now you can see that there are more than one places for burial here because over the course of the year, other people would die. And so you need to have several um, openings and places available for anyone that would also die during the year because it takes about a year to, for the flesh to fully decay. The family would return after the course of the year um, and they would take the bones, and in Old Testament times anyways, they threw them into a common repository underneath, as you see in this cutaway drawing. This is where the biblical expression, to be gathered to one's fathers, comes from. You're literally gathered to your fathers. And your bones are thrown in with Uncle John and Henry and Frank and great-grandfather. Everyone is mixed together. This is the collective identity of ancient Israel. By the way, these students here are illustrating how these burial benches uh, were used. Now inside the repository, we not only find bones, but we find 
um, also pottery because they're giving them burial gifts, okay? But in this particular Cave 25 came this small metal scroll that when it was unrolled bore the priestly benediction known from number six. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and grant you peace. So um, this is dating to about the time of King Josiah. Now, with New Testament burial, it's a little bit different. You're still burying a person. You're wrapping them in a shroud, and you're still burying them for, a period, for about a year to allow the flesh to decay. This takes place in that second room, that inner room. Now, after the course of the year, the family returns, and what they do is they gather the bones, but they don't put them into a common repository underneath. They put them into individual bone boxes called ossuaries. And once they are buried there, then they would be slid into compartments that are in the first room, and that would open the burial bench for future generations of people to die and be buried. And so you'll find these tombs, they're family sepulchers, and they last several uh, generations. Uh, we have one example of a, um, of a Rolling Stone tomb, I think is a, kind of a nice example with the tomb that Jesus was buried in would have looked like. Here you see the entrance to it with the Rolling Stone off to the right. Um, the picture above is showing the first room, which is where all the bone boxes are stored. And then the inner room, you can see the burial bench uh, with that arch above it called an archosolium, um, where the body was laid out and then the bones gathered. So um, the New Testament, a bit more emphasis on the individual, because uh, many of these ossuaries um, even include the name of the person, includes their profession, um, rather than Old Testament times, which is much more collective identity. And that concludes it. So let's thank Bob for his lecture today. Thanks for